Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? In this first lecture, we'll talk all about rings of fractions following section 7.5 of Dummett and Foot. And we'll start this discussion by talking about the example that is most familiar. That is going from the integers z to the rational numbers q. So how do we construct rational numbers out of integers? Well, as ratios of integers. But now let's do this more precisely. So what is an element of q? Well, it's a ratio of two integers, a over b, where a and b are integers, and b is not allowed to be 0. But it can be that many, many, many different uh, a over b give the same rational number. Like 1 half is 2 over 4 is 3 over 6, and so on. So when are two of these things equal? a over b equals c over d, if and only if you cross multiply a, d, and you get b, c. So one way to describe elements of q is as equivalence classes of ordered pairs, a comma b, where b is not equal to 0, and where a over b is equivalent to c over d if and only if a over d, sorry, if, if and only if a d equals b c. All right, you can put a ring structure on this set of equivalence classes of ordered pairs by defining addition and multiplication the way that you think about addition and multiplication of rational numbers. So it'll be convenient to write the equivalence class of the ordered pair a comma b as a over b. So a over b plus c over d will be, well, put it over a common denominator, a d plus b c over b d, and the product is a c over b d. So it's easy to check that this is a ring. Uh, Q has a subring isomorphic to z, consisting of all the elements of the form a comma 1. So a over 1. a is some integer, 1 is the denominator. Uh, and this is a subring. You can check that it's an additive subgroup that is closed under multiplication. Uh, so I want to be a little careful. Z isn't actually exactly a subring of Q in this description where the elements of Q are ordered pairs, equivalence classes of ordered pairs, because an element of Z is just an integer, and an element of Q is an equivalence class of ordered pairs. But if you take all these equivalence classes, a comma 1, that gives a subring of Q that's isomorphic to Z. So what Dummett and Foote do, and what will be really convenient going forward, is to say that this subring of Q that's isomorphic to Z, to actually say something like Z is a subring of Q, when really what we mean is that Q contains this subring isomorphic to Z given by these pairs. OK. So every non-zero element of Z becomes a unit in Q. This is one of the big properties, like 2 is not a unit in Z, but the equivalence class 2 comma 1 is a unit in Q, because 2 comma 1 times 1 comma 2 is the identity, is 1, 1. So we can see that in Z, most elements are not units. But when you look at this subring of Q isomorphic to Z, all the elements in that subring now are units in Q. All right, so maybe this is more confusing that you thought you understood Z and Q better uh, you know, two minutes ago before I started talking about equivalence classes of ordered pairs. But this will be helpful in trying to generalize this construction. So our idea is we're going to try the same thing same thing, which is a little vague, with an arbitrary commutative ring R. So we are going to require that our rings in this lecture, in this section, are commutative, but not necessarily that they have an identity. And one of the first difficulties that we'll see is that if you try to do exactly the same thing, where you allow uh, equivalence class of ordered pairs A comma B, where A and B are any elements in your ring, you have a problem when you allow B to be a zero divisor. So I'm going to pause and erase 
And then I'll explain in a little more detail what goes wrong here. Let's try to do the same construction where we start with a commutative ring R and we find a bigger ring where we take equivalence classes of ordered pairs of elements of R, sort of like uh, what we did in going from Z to Q. So let's say R is a commutative ring. We mentioned that there's a problem if you allow zero divisors in the denominator. So let's see what goes wrong. Let's say that B times D equals zero in R, and let's say D is not zero. For now, just for simplicity, let's suppose that R has a one. So D should be the same as this equivalence class of uh, D over one, like D divided by one. And in this equivalence class, you should also have B D over B. So B is now in the denominator, but B D is zero. So you had zero over B and that should be zero. So uh, first, this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, D is a zero divisor or that B is a zero divisor. B could also be zero, but that's also a problem, right? Because we're writing D over one equals zero over zero. And that's probably something we would like to avoid. So this is a little informal for now, but the whole idea is to motivate the uh, theorem that we're going to state and then prove about building this larger ring of fractions out of a ring R. So if we're going to allow a zero divisor B as a denominator, then this D, which is not zero in R, becomes zero in this hopefully bigger ring uh, that is made up of equivalence classes of ordered pairs of elements in R. So, okay, so something is going wrong if we allow zero divisors in the denominator. What's going wrong? Well, D becomes zero. So there's some collapsing of elements in the ring R, like two things that are not equal in R are becoming equal in this other ring. So R can't be expected anymore to appear as a subring inside this larger ring. So, if we want R to appear as a subring in this ring of equivalence classes of pairs, then we can't allow these zero divisors in the denominator. Maybe it's not so important to us that R appear as a subring, and I'll talk more about that uh, later at the uh, end of this lecture. So, what else is true? Well, if B and D are denominators, then just thinking about how you multiply fractions and you get the denominator of the product to be the product of the denominators, then B times D should be a denominator as well. So the set of denominators that we get has to be closed under multiplication in R. All right, so this is all to motivate the big theorem of this section. This actually isn't even the whole thing. There's a second part that I'll write after going through this and pausing and erasing. So what's the setup? We take R to be a commutative ring and we take D to be a subset of R that is non-empty, it does not contain zero and doesn't contain any zero divisors and it's closed under multiplication. So, okay, so what is D? It's this non-empty set not containing zero or any zero divisors and it's closed under multiplication. So this discussion here is to motivate why those two requirements are on this set D of, think D as denominators. Then there is a commutative ring Q with identity such that Q contains R as a subring. And again, like when we talk about uh, Q, like the rational numbers Q containing Z as a subring, really the elements of Q are these equivalence classes of ordered pairs of elements of Z. So what we should say is that Q contains a subring isomorphic to Z. So here Q contains R as a subring, meaning Q contains a subring isomorphic to R. And so D is the subset of R. What happens to the elements of D inside the subring? Every element of D, maybe it's not a unit in R, but it becomes a unit in Q when you take Q has a subring isomorphic to R. There are these elements of D inside of that subring. Those are all units now in Q.
So think about the construction of R equals Z. D, in this case, well, I'll, I'll talk about this example in a minute, but think of D as all the non-zero integers. And then uh, we have Z inside of Q as the ordered pairs A comma one, and all of the non-zero integers, all of the A comma ones where A is not zero become units in Q, right? So this is just like what we've seen already. All right, so there are two more things I wanna say in this statement. The first one is that every element of Q is of the form R times D inverse for some R in R and D in D. So what does that really mean? Q has a subring isomorphic to R. So this R is like R as an element of this subring of Q that's isomorphic to R. And D inverse, well, inside of this subring of Q isomorphic to R, we have the things in D in that subring, and those are all units. So D inverse is a thing that makes sense now. This is the inverse inside this ring Q. All right, so what does this lead to? Well, if D is every non-zero element of R, then Q is a field. Then every element in Q has an inverse. And why is that? Well, you can just see uh, what, the, um, what the inverse, once you believe that every element can be written as R times D inverse, if D is every non-zero element of R, then you can start to see where all these inverses come from. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna pause and erase this top part and I'll write in the last statement, which is a kind of uniqueness statement for this bigger ring Q that contains this subring isomorphic to R in which all of these elements in D become units. Let's now get the last part of this big theorem. This is this uniqueness statement for Q. It says that the ring Q is the smallest ring containing R in which all elements of D become units. So, okay, what does that really mean? Q contains a subring isomorphic to R and inside this subring, we have every element of D is now a unit in Q. So more precisely, what does that mean smallest ring? So let's say that S is a commutative ring with identity and phi is an injective ring homomorphism from R to S, such that phi of D is a unit in S for every D in R. So what does this mean? So by the first isomorphism theorem, the image is isomorphic to R mod the kernel but if this is injective, the image is going to be some subring of S that's isomorphic to R. And the image of everything in D is going to be a unit in S. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? So S is some ring containing R in which all elements of D become units. Well, the statement is that then there's an injective ring homomorphism, uh, capital Psi from Q to, uh, I guess this is capital Phi? Yeah, I don't know, Greek letters, gotta think about it. From Q to S, such that you take this injective ring homomorphism and you restrict it to R, or really to the isomorphic copy of R inside of Q, and you get Phi. So, uh, ah, capital Phi, yeah. So Q is this ring that's bigger than R, it contains this isomorphic copy of R. But if you look at just what is happening when you apply this homomorphism to the copy of R inside of Q, you're getting exactly V. So uh, what is this saying? What this is really saying, what you should think about this saying is that any ring that contains an isomorphic copy of R in which every element of D becomes a unit, think, S in this statement here, also contains an isomorphic copy of Q. Well, why is that? First isomorphism theorem says that the image of this injective ring homomorphism is a subring of S that's isomorphic to Q. So 
Q is the smallest ring containing R in which all elements of D become units in the sense that if you have another uh, one of these commutative rings containing an isomorphic copy of R in which all the elements in D become units, then it also contains an isomorphic copy of this ring Q. Okay, so I'm going to pause and erase. And uh, the last thing I want to do in this video is draw a helpful diagram explaining this uniqueness and then give you uh, some definitions that we'll talk about more in the later videos of this lecture. So we have this uniqueness statement, this fact that Q is this smallest ring containing R in which all these elements in D become units. And we saw what does that really mean is that any ring that contains an isomorphic copy of R in which every element of D becomes a unit must also contain an isomorphic copy of Q. And now let's look at a diagram where, okay, what's the setup? We have R and we have this homomorphism phi that goes to S. We know that R is a subring of Q, that there's this injective ring homomorphism from R to Q. And what the theorem says is there exists an injective ring homomorphism from Q to S, this map capital phi, such that if you take phi restricted to the isomorphic copy of R inside of Q, you get this original map little phi. So what does that mean? If you follow this diagram around either way, you get the same thing. That if you first take R, send it into Q, and then apply this capital phi, that's the same as if you just applied phi from R to S. OK, so this diagram commutes. This is an example of a universal property. This is something that in a lot of uh, more abstract algebra textbooks, you would see a lot of this kind of language. So I'm not going to pursue that this much here, but it is going to come up a little bit more throughout the rest of uh, 206b. And if you go online and you look around at other sources where you read about rings of fractions, uh, you'll see some of this kind of language. OK, so I'm just going to say quickly and come back to this later that there is a more general result than this theorem 15, where D is now allowed to have 0 or 0 divisors. This is discussed in section 15.4 on localization. And I'll state what that more general result is uh, later on in this lecture. So we already saw that if you allow 0 or 0 divisors in de the denominators, then you're going to have some elements D that are not zero in R that become zero in this bigger ring, or not bigger ring, I should say, in this ring whose elements are equivalence classes of ordered pairs, these fractions. So what we're going to lose in allowing zeros and zero divisors is R might not be a subring of this ring that you get anymore. Okay, so the last thing in this video. I want to give two definitions now that we've stated this big theorem about this ring Q that exists. So this ring Q is called the ring of fractions of D with respect to R, right? Okay, so D is this set of denominators that are going to define these elements in Q. They're going to be equivalence classes of ordered pairs, something in R comma something in D. So it's the ring of fractions of D. D is allowed in the denominator with respect to R, which will be all the numerators in these fractions. And we're going to denote this with D inverse R. There's a particularly important special case, which is when R is an integral domain. So we're already requiring that uh, R is a commutative ring if we want to also require that there are no zero divisors. And D now, well, it's a multiplicatively closed set with no zero divisors. If R is an integral domain, you can take all the non-zero elements of R so if you make that choice for D, and you take Q to be equal to this ring of fractions, D inverse R, what you get, the first part of the moreover part of the statement said that in this case, Q is actually a field. That field gets a name. It's called the field of fractions or the quotient field of the ring R. So we'll discuss this uh, more. We'll prove this theorem in one of the next videos. but. Before jumping into the proof, I think it's going to be really helpful to first think about some examples.